Hi, everybody. We're going to get started right on time because I want to make sure people are still uh, uh, arriving, but I want to make sure we have time to introduce our speaker for today's special grand rounds and have time for questions and answers as well. So with uh, no further ado, I'm going to call up uh, Dr. Steve Gittleman to introduce the, uh, give us a little bit of a history of the Grumbach Award and then introduce our speaker for today, Steve. Thank you, Rafi, and good to be with you this afternoon. This is always a special uh, part of the Grand Rounds uh, presentations each year. And uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce you to Melvin Grumbach and, and this award that's presented annually to the um, fellow who's uh, made the greatest contribution in research across the department. And um, so let me start off a little bit just introducing you to who Dr. Grumbach was. And um, let's see, I'm advancing Kayla's slides rather than my own, it looks like here. Okay. You're advancing in the back. Okay. So, um, you know, when you think about someone's contributions uh, in their career, you can think about their individual achievement. And I can't help but make basketball analogies in, in how am I going to say. So, in some ways, Dr. Grumbach was the Steph Curry of his time uh, in pediatric endocrinology. And next slide. Um, but he was also, uh, you know, part of a part of a team uh, and, you know, a very robust, successful division, but also department. And so in some ways, um, you know, he was, he was uh, quite uh, a renowned coach. So next slide. And, you know, as a result of this, he won a lot of the uh, greatest recognitions for a physician scientist uh, during his career. And next slide. Um, and I just wanted to highlight his leadership positions over the years. And what I'm showing in yellow here, um, he was the uh, chair of our department for 20 years. Um, and, um, and then what happened beyond that was that he stayed quite engaged throughout the later years of his career. Um, so leadership positions across departments of pediatrics and uh, the world of endocrinology and I knew him uh, primarily in his emeritus role. So he came into the office for 20 plus years, read widely, kept us all on our toes, um, stayed up on the advancements. So quite a model career in so many different ways. So next slide. Um, and, and beyond what he did here, um, you know, he was very engaged with training the next generation of physician scientists. And so it's really quite impressive to just see who came through our fellowship program and where they went in the world of academic medicine uh, and uh, uh, other levels of uh, leadership in, in, uh, in the world. Uh, so this includes 40 division chiefs, 13 chairs of departments of pediatrics, two deans, and many other people who have done great things in, in the world of medicine. So um, I just want to acknowledge the members of our committee who have uh, worked with me over the years, Sanjeev Dattar, uh, Charlie Irwin, Phil Rosenthal, Emily Von Shaven, uh, Quintara Foulard has taken over some of the administrative duties to help support us. And our charge is really a difficult one because we receive uh, nominating packages from many of the divisions across the department and their fellows that are doing some very impressive things uh, in basic translational and clinical research. So it makes it very tough for us to pick one winner. Um, next slide. So here are some of the past award winners. You know, I think uh, this is really a who's who of academic uh, pediatricians, some of whom have stayed on here, some have gone throughout the country or the world. Um, and I know you can't see all these names. The next slide continues the list. One thing I probably should have highlighted is who stayed on here at UCSF. So um, we've been very fortunate to retain a lot of these uh, outstanding trainees and they've gone on to do great things, of course. Next slide. So I wanted to acknowledge the uh, nominees that didn't receive the award this year because each of these individuals 
um, has done some amazing work and um, has uh, you know very promising career ahead. And then why don't we move on to the next slide? Um, so before I announce the winner, um, I just wanted to uh, make this acknowledgement about our use of the land. Um, so we want to acknowledge the Ramaytush and Ohlone people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to the Ramaytush and Ohlone owners, past, present, uh, elders, past, present, and future, who call this place, the land that UCSF sits upon, their home. And we're proud to continue their tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Amitush Ohlone community for their stewardship and support. We look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. So with that acknowledgement of the land, I'd like to acknowledge the Grumbach Award winner. Uh, next slide. Um, and it is not two this year, uh, unless she has a talk prepared. <laughs> Um, sorry, so the award winner, uh, I think, has been announced by email, but now we get to acknowledge her in person is Kayla Carvinen. And um, brief word about uh, Kayla's uh, academic journey. Uh, so she received her undergraduate degree from Rice. She moved on to medical school at the University of Virginia. And then fortunately for us, came to UCSF for her pediatric residency and then moved into a neonatology fellowship. And her work is focused on investigating structural racism and its contribution to local and population level racial in inequities in adverse outcomes among infants who were born preterm. Her current research centers on black preterm infants and their caregivers, investigating strategies to promote the opportunity for families to thrive from the neonatal intensive care unit to home. So I will stop talking and turn it over to Kayla. Thank you so much for that extremely kind introduction. Um, I feel very grateful to be here and giving grand rounds today and to um, receive this award. And I'm really happy to see many friendly faces um, in the Department of Pediatrics and want to make sure that I say early on that all of the work that I've done has been in teams and not in a silo. And so um, I've the favorite part of really creating this presentation for me was finding many of your pictures and putting them on the slides um, where you guys have been collaborators. So um, today I'll be speaking about confronting racism to advance neonatal health equity. So I have no financial interest to disclose, but I do want to be really clear that my lived experience and my identities inform my research. And so I'm Black, I'm biracial, I'm a woman, and all of these identities inform my research, and I really center my communities in my research. And I'm hoping that at the end of this presentation, you'll be able to describe um, foundational concepts like race, racism, and health equity, but also um, apply those concepts to neonatal um, inequities research. And if you're interested, plan get, to get involved in local and national efforts to advance neonatal equity. So starting with some foundational concepts. So race is an interesting term or concept. Um, in the 1500s, it was infrequently used. And when it was used, it was used in a more general term to indicate kinship. And it wasn't until the 1600s when Europeans came to North America to um, that they redefined race as a social construct to really justify slave labor. And so we know we have these hierarchical groups that are um, 
categorized by skin color and physical features, which is how race is now defined. And it's important to note that um, pseudoscience was really used to justify those hierarchical groups. So at the time, it was thought that, um, you know, by European colonists that white people were inherently smarter or more capable or more human than non-white people. And scientists really conflated race and genetics to justify the, that hierarchy. And we know that the definitions of race and racism have changed and developed over time, but that historical context is extremely important. Camera Phyllis Jones said that racism is a system of structuring opportunities that assigns um, opportunity and value based on the social interpretation of how one looks that advantages some communities and disadvantages others. And importantly, it saps the strength of our whole society through the waste of human resources. And racism is not just a historical concept, but it's a reality that um, all of us impact, are impacted by today. And so we know that there's been a history of racist policies, practices, procedures, um, and laws in America that have resulted in an unequal distribution of resources and social determinants of health, especially for black communities. Um, so um, resources like economic opportunity and access to safe neighborhoods and housing and high quality education are all disproportionately distributed in our society today. And the classical historical example that people use when they think about structural racism is redlining. So in the 1930s, there's a federal program that categorized different neighborhoods based off of how desirable they were. And it was color coded. So the um, most ris risky neighborhoods were coded as red and the most um, desirable neighborhoods were coded as green. And we know that that was a color-coded system that explicitly segregated um, our communities based off of racial and eth ethnic groups, specifically for Black residents and people of color. And that's important because um, home ownership is the most important means of wealth building in America. And so um, Black residents who lived in these red-coded areas was very difficult for them to um, buy homes and obtain mortgages. And it doesn't take very long to look at the map of San Francisco as Bay Area residents to recognize areas like the Tenderloin or the Bayview, where we have the highest concentration of Black communities, and yet they're the most impoverished and underserved areas in our communities. Um, so certainly history impacts us today. And even though redlining was officially banned, we still have lasting, long-lasting consequences of um, redlining. So Camera Phyllis Jones said that the variable race is only a rough proxy for socioeconomic status and culture, but it precisely captures the social classification of people in a race conscious society like ours in America. And the variable race is not a biological construct that reflects innate differences, but instead a social construct that precisely captures the impacts of racism. So how does racism result? Um, relate to healthcare. So structural racism um, is a core driver of racial inequities and in health outcomes, and it operates through unequal social determinants of health or social drivers of health. And that's a narrative that's really needed reframing over time. So historically, scientists have blamed um, marginalized communities for their poor health outcomes by using things like behavior or genetics to justify differences in racial inequities and in health outcomes. And it's now understood that racism in all of its forms are the core driver of racial inequities and health outcomes. And so the question is no longer, what is it about a specific marginalized group that um, predisposes them to poor health outcomes intrinsically, but instead how have we as a society treated different groups um, to result in poor health outcomes, especially for marginalized groups. And I felt very strongly about the importance of emphasizing this when conducting racial inequities research um, so, you know, it's really important to contextualize racial inequities and white supremacy and racism and oppression and colonialism, really giving that historical context so that folks don't lead to stereotypical um, answers or the biological fallacy of race. And so, for example, um, I've really tried hard to make sure that that's clear in my, in my scholarly work. And so, for example, um, we wrote a narrative review about the racial inequities of um, preterm infant comorbidities. So Liz Rogers, Sapphire McKenzie Sampson, Faith Garanga, and I wrote this review. And in it, we really um, contextualize all of our inequities within this history. But it's not just about how we as 
individuals talk about racial inequities, like individual scientists. It's also the systems that allow narratives to be perpetuated over time. So we all know that when you write a paper, it goes out to your peer reviewers and editors who all review the work um, and allow it to be published. And so um, I certainly have experiences of hitting roadblocks when submitting my work where I've encountered bias or knowledge gaps from reviewers and editors. Um, and um, that's certainly a part of the experience when one writes about racism. And so we wrote about this together with um, some of the neonatal equity researchers that I've become familiar with. And um, one way to think about changing the system is really diversifying who has a seat at the table. So I had the privilege of working with my sister, who's a pediatric hematologist and oncologist at Seattle Children's. Um, and we wrote about one strategy to overcome this type of barrier by diversifying medical editorial journal boards um, in, in a, in a um, perspective piece. And, and I think that's really important to think about who has a seat at the table. It's important for so many reasons. Um, we know that our medical and research um, workforce does not look like our patient population. We know that when we do have a diverse workforce, that it results in better patient care, higher quality research, more innovative research through a number of mechanisms. And this is actually a concept that can be talked about for a long time, an entire talk in and of itself. We're actually writing a book chapter in a um, with some of our co colleagues at UCSF in an anti-racism toolkit. Um, and on this whole topic, but my point is, is that it's possible to diversify our workforce and we've done it here at pediatric, our pediatric residency program, um, but it takes intentional and substantive efforts um, to recruit, retain and support individuals in, in an inclusive environment, which is really important. So you can see here is um, a table of, of the matriculating interns at UCSF um, from 2015 to 2022. And we've certainly made big changes in our underrepresented in medicine matriculating interns. Um, so we certainly increased our numbers, um, but it's more, it's more than just increasing our, our workforce diversity, but really fostering an inclusive um, community. And so that's the effort of um, the pediatrics department, lots of effort. It takes a village, but I want to highlight specifically the pediatric residents who've put a lot of effort into making um, this possible. And so the pediatric diversity committee is what it used to be called, but now it's called the RISE Coalition. I had the opportunity of um, leading this coalition with not um, with several of my colleagues. And so pictured here, I have um, nine of us who were leading the um, collaborative over the course of six years. And we described in a paper um, the ways in which we advocated for institutional commitment for DEI and anti-racism, how we recruited and retained um, a diverse group of residents over this time period, how we developed the anti-racism and um, DEI curriculum, how we centered our communities in our work and how we try to foster a climate of, that was inclusive. And so we highlighted all of our outcomes and um, experiences, but also our challenges in addition to our successes as um, to share less important lessons learned for other academic institutions who are trying to do this work. So this was one of the highlights of my pediatric residency um, and certainly want to showcase the RISE Coalition who continue to do really great work. So as promised, I'll talk about neonatology and research. Um, so the field of neonatology is not immune to racial inequities and in health outcomes. I think you guys are all probably very familiar with this data that shows that black and indigenous Birthing people are like are at higher risk of preterm birth, infant mortality, and low birth weight infants. This is true for California. This is true across the country. This is data from 2016 to 2019, but it's um, a persistent finding over decades. And that was new information to me that I was learning as a pediatric resident, and I was really interested in how racial inequities might follow preterm infants home. And so I approached Matt Pantel to ask this question and he connected me with the preterm birth initiative. And we ended up conducting a retrospective cohort study where we investigated racial inequities and in preterm infant outcomes over the first year of life. And so we um, used a birth cohort database. So it's the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development has a birth cohort database of all of California births. So it included over 3 million infants. And we found that when we compared different infant 
racial groups to um, white infants, given the history of white supremacy in America, that Black and Latinx preterm infants were more likely to visit the acute care or emergency room, be readmitted to the hospital. In the case of Black preterm infants, soberingly, they were more likely to die after hospital discharge. And we know that um, birthing people and their infants are inextricably linked in terms of their health and well being. And so we also um, found that Black birthing people who had preterm infants were more likely to be have a mental health related emergency room and hospitalization compared to white birthing people. And we suspected that those differences were due to structural racism, but I didn't have a way to measure that at the time. And so I approached Brittany Chambers and Sapphire McKenzie Sampson to utilize the index of concentration at the extremes, which is a spatial social polarization metric. So it measures the racial and economic segregation as a proxy for structural racism. And so we use that same population birth cohort, but also census track level data to um, as an exposure for structural racism at birth. And we found that black birthing people who delivered preterm who lived in the least privileged areas so the areas most subject to structural racism, the highest racial and economic segregation were more likely than those who lived in the more privileged areas to have infants who had these frequent acute care visits, readmissions and death after discharge. And I was pretty overwhelmed at this point as a pediatric resident. Like, how could I change these racial inequities, the, their population level? This is across the state of California. What can I do as a singular person to really impact these inequities? And so um, I actually pivoted at this point to focus on something I felt like I had control over, which was looking at more local inequities and how I could address them in our NICU. So I'm going to follow this chronologically, but I'll come back to this bigger picture question that I've um, had the opportunity to answer more closer to the end of the presentation. So the majority of my research time has been spent locally in the REJOICE study. So this is the racial and ethnic justice and outcomes in neonatal intensive care study. Um, this is a study that I conducted with uh, my fellow PIs, um, Monica McLemore, Brittany Chambers, Olga Smith, and Liz Rogers. And we wanted to conduct a study that examined the ways in which structural racism is operationalized within our NICU here at UCSF. And so we had a pilot study where we examined our standards of care, our neonatal outcomes, and the lived experiences of families and providers by racial and ethnic groups in our NICU. And our fa first phase was really investigation, so understanding where racial inequities exist hyperlocally by extracting data from the electronic medical records. Um, we also had a qualitative arm where we conducted surveys with open-ended questions and struck um, interviews with both parents and providers. And our phase two is really coming back to the community to see what their recommendations are for change in action within our NICU. So this is data from 2017 to 2019. I'm gonna start with the quantitative data. Uh, we conducted unadjusted logistic regression models to test the association between race and ethnicity and standards of care and outcomes. Um, and as you can see here, there, we found very few differences in racial and ethnic, between racial and ethnic groups in these outcomes among very preterm infants. Um, notably though, black and Hispanic um, preterm infants were less likely to go home on human breast milk. And they're more likely to experience necrotizing enterocolitis, which we know is an intestinal condition that preterm infants are at risk for. Um, and we know that breast milk actually um, protects against this condition. So these two factors are very much interrelated. Um, and these same inequities have been shown in California. So this is not unique to UCSF. This is data from 2008 to 2017 um, that shows the same patterns where Black and Hispanic infants are less likely to go home on human milk and more likely to experience necrotizing enterocolitis. And this is um, a concept that I think will, will occur throughout presenting about the REJOICE study. None of these findings are unique to UCSF. They're not unique to our unit. They're not unique to our institution, the Bay Area, California. This is um, across the United States. And this is the way that structural ra racism is um, pervasive and it infiltrates all of our institutions. So um, this finding of inequities in breast milk and necrotizing enterocolitis really inspired the Grow Babies Grow QI initiative for this year. So this year, 
um, the QI team in the NICU decided to focus on how we can decrease the discrepancies. Um, and so we generated primary drivers and secondary drivers that are um, contributing to these inequities. And then we generated uh, potential interventions and we started to roll that out in July this year. And the intervention that I'm most excited about is one that's anti-racist, that is designed to ameliorate the um, effects of structural racism on Black and Latinx um, birthing persons. And so we um, are financially compensating Black and Latinx families um, who have the intention of providing breast milk and who have delivered preterm infants. And, you know, the um, exciting part of that intervention for me is that it's a really an equity intervention where you're targeting those who have the most need um, and providing them with resources um, and um, so that they have the equal opportunity to, um, to do something like um, have breast milk, which is, we know, really important for our babies. And we know that breastfeeding is not um, uh, free labor by any means and that Black and Latinx families are subject to structural racism and income inequalities that really drive that um, inequity. So we were also um, interested in understanding policing in the hospital. This is becoming increasingly reported in the hospital, law enforcement activity and policing activity. And so we know that policing has negative effects on physical and mental health, as well as social, legal, and ethical effects. Um, we also know that minoritized groups are burdened by policing and healthcare. Um, there is some certainly sobering studies, especially in pediatric um, emergency rooms recently published in JAMA that describe um, black and brown children being physically restrained and having security calls more often than their white counterparts. We also know that there's disparate urine toxicology screening and labor and delivery room, rooms across America. So um, even though there is a, a similar rates of drug use by racial and ethnic groups, um, black and brown birthing people are more likely to be tested for drugs in labor and delivery rooms. And we also know that there's racial inequities in our CPS referrals and pediatrics. And Heather Briscoe has a really excellent publication called Do No Harm that describes this in um, a lot of detail. But there's not a lot of data that talk about policing in the NICU. There's no reason to believe that the NICU is any different than any other part of the hospital. Um, so, but we, um, don't know how it how it plays out in the NICU. And so we wanted to understand the ways in which policing happens in the NICU in the Rejoice study. And so April Edwell, Sasha Andusko, Liz Rogers, and I were invited to write a case series for NEO review. So we'll be reviewing a case that happened in our NICU and then describing some of the Rejoice study findings that I'll show um, as well in this bigger context of policing in America and policing in the hospital. So in the Rejoice study, we um, thought it prudent to um, look into these ways in which policing may happen in the NICU. Um, and so we called them adverse social events and grouped them, including um, child protective services, referrals, behavioral contracts, security, emergency response calls, and urine toxicology screens. And these are all um, decisions that are made by clinical teams, and they're made with the intention of promoting a safe home and hospital environment. And um, we know that they can be influ influenced by implicit bias. We know that they also can um, result in significant harm to families, can fracture relationships between healthcare systems and parents. Um, and everyone wants to avoid these. Healthcare providers want to avoid these. Um, healthcare systems and families all want to avoid these types of events and they should be avoided if possible. Um, but I think it's important to say that societal inequities even beyond the hospital certainly contribute to the risk of an individual having um, several of these adverse social events irrespective of our, of our hospital decisions. So when we looked at adverse social events in our UCSF NICU from the same time period, 2017 to 2019, we found that they were relatively uncommon. Um, so out of the 3,290 uh, hospitalizations, 6% of those had um, included some type of adverse social event. Um, so CPS referrals and urine toxicology screens were um, the more common relatively, three and a half and four and a half of um, percent of hospitalizations and behavioral contracts and security calls were more rare. And so we, there was 17 behavioral contracts over the course of three years. 
and 40 security emergency response calls over the course of three years. Um, <clears throat> and for the more uh, rare adverse outcomes, that's pretty hard to analyze statistically, but I think it's important to note that um, out of those uh, in our NICU, Black families make up 8% of our NICU population. And for the behavioral contracts, 11 out of 17 behavioral contracts were made with Black families, so 65% of them. And 38% of security calls were made on Black families, so 15 out of the 40. So certainly a concerning trend here. When we compared adverse events by racial groups and controlled for length of stay for our more um, relatively more common adverse social events, we found that Black and Indigenous families were more likely to experience CPS referrals and urine toxicology screens, as well as any adverse social event. And this is the first study that we're aware of to describe these types of policing in the um, NICU. But again, this is not unique to the NICU. Um, so we had about 3,000 hospitalizations. Um, April Edwell and Matt Pentel did a study recently that's forthcoming that um, looked at uh, 100 times that sample size, so over 300 hospitalizations at UCSF, including adult and pediatric units. Um, and they were looking at behavioral flags. So these are in the electronic medical record, um, the flags that pop up on the chart that include things like CPS referrals or security calls, but they also include um, flags for inappropriate behavior, witness substance use with the risk of self-harm, violent behavior, dismissal from a practice, et cetera. So even a wider range of um, outcomes. And they found similar act, um, uh, patterns where black and indigenous families um, or people were more likely to experience these behavioral flags or have them in the chart. And they can, had the same conclusion where these are often made with the intention of promoting a safe, hospital environment, um, but certainly can have harm, especially when they're disproportionately distributed among our populations and or based on demographics. So wrapping up the quantitative data from the Rejoice study, we surveyed parents and providers about their own experiences with racism and discrimination using the everyday discrimination scale that's adapted for medical settings. And so we distribute this in 2021 to 2022, 113 parents and 92 providers filled out our survey. Um, we invited all people of every demographic to um, answer this, these questions. And we asked them in different ways. So each panel you see on this figure is a different way in which we ask the question. So um, for example, for parents experience, we asked about parents about their own experiences with racism. So the question stem was, please think of all the care that you've received since being admitted to the NICU. When getting healthcare, how often have any of the following things happened to you because of your, um, you or your baby because of your race, ethnicity or color? And, um, you can see that most of the time for parents, they said 90 plus percent of the time that they've never had that experience of racism and discrimination or NICU, fortunately. Um, when you look at when we asked providers of what they witnessed in terms of racism and discrimination, um, they were more likely to say that they sometimes see families experience that. Um, and then when we asked providers about their own experiences, they pretty with even frequency said never, rarely, or sometimes experience racism or discrimination. So as you can see, um, when we statistically analyze that difference between providers witness versus provider um, versus parent experience and provider experience versus parent experience, there certainly was um, a significant difference in our median total score where providers are more likely to report witnessing um, and experiencing racism than families were. Again, can't emphasize this enough, not unique to our institution. So this is a um, paper from Stanford that described 324 um, accounts of disparities of care described by nurses, doctors, um, NNPs, and family advocates. And they described different types of disparate care. So neglectful care, judgmental care, systemic barriers to care that all resulted in suboptimal care, as well as priority treatment for um, some families that result in privileged care and all of the demographics that go along with those um, different types of care, including language barriers, socioeconomic or racial and ethnic differences. And there's several other studies in, um, that have described, especially Black families' experience with 
um, or their concern for uh, nursing support, lack of compassion, respectful communication, and less attentive care of their infants. Um, and we know that um, non-white and low-income families are also more likely to be less satisfied with their NICU experience. And these are studies across the country um, published in pediatrics and journal of the Journal of Perinatology. So I'm gonna go through a couple of quotes that are disheartening. These are quotes from um, our NICU, their survey from surveys, but they're also from interviews, starting with parents and then followed by providers. Um, so a Latinx parent said, I feel sometimes it can be my baby's care times, but the staff will not come because she is with her other patient whose family is the same race as them. I can also see a look of mugging when they walk in my room. A black parent said, a provider made me cry with uncaring bedside manner, explained things to me as if I were stupid and kept looking at their watch. A staff member said, the ICN frontline providers are not as diverse as their patient population. We lack employees who are bilingual and that often leads to families whose first language is not English to be not as strongly advocated for. Another staff member said, I feel like as a black woman, I notice that when I take care of black families, they lay everything out on the table for me, their woes and their relief that I'm there. And finally, a staff member said, bring it to the forefront so everyone knows and can make positive changes, which was exactly our intent, intent and what we've done. So we've disseminated this information to nursing and medical leadership in the NICU, to physicians, social work, nursing staff, forums, and most importantly, we brought this information back to the community to develop recommendations of how we can deliver better care. And so this is a concept called um, centering in the margins, um, which is a concept in critical race theory, which really centers our discourse from the starting point, which is the majority group's perspective, the traditional way of um, looking for solutions to the marginalized group. And that can enhance the relevancy of our findings for communities and provide disciplines with fresh perspectives on old problems. So we, as phase two of the Rejoice study conducted community advisory board sessions, it's a little meta, this is me presenting here in this spot <laughs> this year. Um, but over this past year, we um, had four group it, four focus group sessions where we invited families, so parents who um, identified as Black or Latinx to um, participate in conversations, um, and they had children who were spent time in our NICU, as well as staff who, were, um, who work in the UCSF NICU to come together to hear about all of the findings from the Rejoice study, so all the quantitative and qualitative data that I shared, plus more that I'm not able to um, share time-wise here today. And we developed together recommendations to improve, improve the experience for families. And we presented those recommendations back to our leadership. And when I say we, I mean, actually the parents presented to NICU and hospital leadership um, about their recommendations of how we think they think that we should do things differently. So they had four main recommendations. Um, the first one was um, a neonatal doula or a family liaison position. So this is somebody with lived experience and professional experience who can help orient families to the NICU, function as a third party advocate if necessary, provide mental health and general resources support. We have an amazing family liaison in our NICU, but she's part time and she can't see or provide her all of her services to every family member and the family members certainly notice that gap. They also um, really wanted more humanism from staff. And so they developed minimum criteria for every staff, every encounter, which means when you walk into a, room, a patient's um, room that they would experience eye contact, a greeting and an introduction. Um, and if necessary, an interpreter, hopefully an in-person interpreter was their preference um, when they received daily updates. And they certainly wanted to see more diverse staff. So more black staff, more staff who spoke Spanish specifically were their requests. And then the last two recommendations that they had really were reflections of them, the, their desire to be care partners. So the, um, they wanted more information in terms of discharge education as um, they go out into the world. Now they're the caregivers for their children. They wanted to be prepared. They wanted more time rooming in for education. They wanted a better primary care physician transition so the PCP knows their baseline, especially if they're medically complex. 
um, an emergency plan with who to call. They wanted a phone call from us from the NICU after being discharged. And then during the hospital stay, as their last recommendation, they really wanted more education, more orientation, and a roadmap to discharge with goals and milestones. What I haven't um, emphasized, what I need to is um, through the surveys and the interviews there, I cannot say enough about how much general gratitude family has for all the families had for excellent care in the NICU. So I think both things can be true. There's lots of positive information that we received from their joy study of um, examples of excellent care. Um, I'm not focusing on those today because I'm focusing on things that we can do differently and better, um, but certainly want to extend that appreciation um, that cannot be understated that also is um, occurs in our study. So if you asked, um, in addition to the family recommendations, if you asked Abram Kendi, who's a scholar in this field, um, how can one be anti-racist? How can an institution be anti-racist? Um, I would believe you would say um, that an anti-racist, uh, it would be by conducting and having anti-racist policies. And so he defines that as, um, any measure that produces or sustains racial equity between racial groups. By policy, I mean written and unwritten rules, laws, procedures, processes, regulations, and guidelines that govern people. So really focusing on policy change um, for anti-racism in institutions. And there's many ongoing UCSF initiatives to address um, racial inequities here. Um, some of them are rejoice informed, which we're really proud of, and some of them are just related to the rejoice study. So I've listed a few here, but it's not all encompassing. encompassing. Um, so there's an OB social collaborative, so an OB team led by residents who've been working really hard to uh, develop a urine toxicology screen test that's equitable and anti-racist. Um, we um, have had changes or um, to the CPS referral policies, which were quite outdated here at UCSF. Um, and um, there was recently a grand rounds with Chris Stewart describing this some, um, and Jamila Nightingale has been hired as um, a consultant for CPS referrals. And we've certainly been utilizing her expertise in the NICU. Um, we, there's a nursing group that of nursing leaders who've held every two weeks these sessions where they um, were all taught about DEI and anti-racism concepts for the last few years um, that nurses get paid for, which is um, a really amazing intervention. We're also starting health equity rounds within those spaces where we're able to talk about cases real time and how we can do things differently. April Edwell has started these anti-racist de-escalation simulations. Um, in the PICU setting, really addressing that security call and behavioral flag inequity. And then there's, of course, code care, which is um, the attempt to provide multi layers of support um, before calling security that's been enacted across uh, units in the hospital. I don't have data to show that these policy changes have improved the racial inequities yet, but I certainly hope to be able to track this and report back on findings over time. So, um, I've spent a lot of time talking about in the hospital what we can do differently. I've had a little bit more time and space to imagine like how we can do things differently in the state of California or outside of the hospital. Um, so specifically, how do we support black preterm infants after they go home? And really to prioritize the perspective of the perspectives of black caregivers and their preterm infants. Um, patients Afulani and I are leading a team of residents and medical students and a nurse um, in Oakland, the Oakland NICU to conduct qualitative interviews where we ask families about what is it that they need for positive child health and development and how can we identify barriers and facilitators um, of social drivers of health or social needs screening and interventions both within the NICU and outside of the NICU and primary care. Um, we want our results to certainly be used and be informative. And so we're hoping they inform our practices in the NICU, but also Bloom Clinic, which um, is an incredible clinic that just launched in July. If you haven't heard of it yet, this is a the Black Baby Equity Clinic. This is a clinic with wraparound pediatric primary care services and racially concordant providers in Oakland in the FQHC there. Um, there's many services that they provide, racially concordant um, uh, pediatricians, but also a lactation consultant, mental health care providers, family resource navigators, and all of these 
bells and whistles of social drivers of health um, needs referrals and screening and ACEs screening and referrals and um, group education and peer support groups, really a new model, a multi-pronged intervention to help best support Black families when they go home. And for me as an early career researcher, this was an amazing opportunity to have this like natural multi-pronged intervention occurring locally um, that, um, that could address these inequities for preterm infants. And so we're actually over recruiting um, families who have preterm infants into this clinic and we'll be able to study there. Um, and I was invited to be a part of this research along with Nikki Bush and Amanda Noronha Zhao and um, to take the op this opportunity and really understand like how does the Bloom Clinic function um, and are we able to improve racial inequities locally. And so we're conducting a program evaluation that's a um, both a um, standard, a comparison for a Bloom Clinic and a standard clinic, standard of care at the FQHC and also a pre and post Bloom Clinic evaluation for families who take um, part in this clinic. And so we're working on our IRB and um, we're hoping to evaluate process measures. Like, are we able to recruit and retain families in Bloom Clinic? Are we able to do the things that we hope to do, like screen for social needs and refer them as necessary? Um, but also, are we able to move the needle on family satisfaction with care, um, decrease the incidence of racism in the medical city, setting, increase medical trust, um, improve person-centered care with racially concordant providers, our families, um, do they feel more parenting and breastfeeding self-efficacy when they're coached by and supported by, um, by racially concordant providers in a um, safe space? And then of course, are we able to move the needle on health outcomes? So general health, um, healthcare utilization, et cetera. So, um, as I became familiar with the neonatal health equity landscape, I certainly became um, aware of these natural silos that we have in medicine in general. You know, we tend to talk to each other in our own institution, in our own um, coast, um, in our own state, in the academic center, um, centers instead of community centers, and we would talk as physicians to physicians and nurses to nurses, but not a lot of crosstalk um, and collaboration when we think about um, medical work and neonatal equity work specifically. And so I saw a lot of inefficiency and duplication and loss of information, missed opportunities. And on a personal standpoint, this work is certainly really hard and can lead to isolation and burnout. And so if we work together, I imagined that um, we would have more of a sharing of resources and information, more um, productivity and efficiency, more innovation, and personally, more satisfaction and opportunities. And so um, Liz Rogers and I had conversations um, over many um, meetings where we talked about these differences and how we could address them nationally. And so she really encouraged me to launch the Neonatal Justice Collaborative um, and co-found this collaborative that's focused on um, promoting neonatal equity and justice through collaboration. And um, uh, well, the first step we did was really reach out to other experts in the field who were emerging their junior faculty members across the country. Do you have a similar experience? Do you think there's a space for a collaborative like this to exist? And they were very enthusiastic. So we actually started with eight people who are part of the steering committee where we imagined what the neonatal justice collaborative would look like, our mission, our vision, the structure of the um, collaborative. And we've grown tremendously over time. You just in uh, Last month, we had 258 members. Admittedly, we're mostly physicians, but we certainly have a um, diverse and growing diver diverse group of family advocates, parents, nurses, um, community members, et cetera, who really bring um, vital um, perspectives to our work. And we have a lot of leaders who are extremely um, well-networked and well-positioned um, to really move our work forward. And so we have several subcommittees, a policy and advocacy subcommittee, medical education and workforce diversity subcommittee, QI and research subcommittee, and each subcommittee has their own set of goals and aims, et cetera. Um, and we've had many events. We've written papers together. We've um, conducted works in progress sessions where we've had multidisciplinary input um, to advance research and um, that our works in progress um, including financial burden and of NICU stays and measuring racism in the NICU. We've had 
several speaker series where um, folks talk about their experience as physician advocates or medical educators. We've had an op-ed workshop that Rachel Fleshman, who is a neonatologist who actually writes for the Times and the Lancet, come teach us how to write op-eds and be advocates. Um, and then we've hosted many sessions at um, Vermont o Oxford Network, which is the largest NICU QI group and um, PAS. So this is our first smaller group at PAS, um, our first year. And we've really grown tremendously. This is our last networking event um, where we've had um, so many people sharing and collaborating together. This is sort of my dream when I thought about the NJC of like how we can share and network and collaborate. Um, and so watching this was really satisfying for me, watching people make connections. Um, and then we had a workshop where we um, talked about strategies to overcome barriers that we've faced in neonatal equity works. So we had our NJC leaders as well as like AAP leaders come help facilitate small group discussions where we talked about um, barriers to neonatal equity work and strategies that they've used to overcome them. And we're writing up our findings and this was a really um, innovative, exciting workshop. So if you're interested, feel free to follow the QR code to uh, the listserv um, where you can join our group and hear about our next events. Um, you can follow us or visit our website um, as well. And I just wanna extend a really um, heartfelt thank you to all of my collaborators and colleagues, um, especially Liz Rogers and Matt Pantel. Like I wouldn't be pursuing a career in academic medicine without you guys. Um, and so you guys have been really true sponsors in residency and fellowship. So really wanna say thank you to all of um, the pediatric departments as well and all of my collaborator, collaborators, the preterm birth initiative and the UCSF NICU. Um, you can't do this work in all NICUs across the country. This our NICU has funded and supported our work um, wholeheartedly and um, certainly appreciate that. Uh, so thank you guys. I'm happy to take any questions. Maybe to recognize people with questions and because there are people on Zoom, maybe just repeat the question. So maybe I'll ask the first one. Um, great presentation. Thank you so much. You've just uh, shined a, a light in so many important places for us. Um, my, you know, my, my piece of the puzzle is, is a clinical trialist. And um, there's a lot of challenges with having representation representative enrollment in trials. And I, I know there's a lot of important, you know, perspective clinical studies, research studies go on in the NICU. Have you thought of expanding some of this uh, assessment to those areas and how we get better inclusion of underrepresented minorities in studies? That's a really relevant question. Uh, I wish that my twin sister was here to answer that question. So she's a pediatric hematologist and oncologist at Seattle Children's, and that's her whole future work. She's writing her K on how to diversify, especially in cancer trials, um, pediatric patients. And so um, I'm certainly learning more about it. I think that um, it's actually something I haven't looked a ton into, our neonatal clinical trials and how diverse they are. I know in general that we have a lot of work to do in terms of diversifying our RCTs um, because uh, that's how we know that the interventions are effective in all populations. And that's certainly a place where inequities can, um, can grow is when we only look at interventions in um, monolithic populations, and then it's not applicable to all populations. So that's certainly a place where racial inequities are. are. Um, yeah, I'm always trying to figure out how I can focus on <laughs> one, you know, singular problems within this multi-huge um, network of problems, but that's certainly one really important um, direction. How yeah, Betsy? Uh, you know, you know, your talk is so inspiring. We're so proud of you. Graduating this year after. I could ask you many, but one I was really curious about is in your Rejoice study, when you ask the parents experiences of racism, why do you think that they, why do you think that they didn't want to speak up or maybe were reluctant to say that they? 
Sure, sure. Yeah. So the question was, when we asked families in the Rejoice study about their experiences with racism, um, why were there few respondents or why pe did people not disclose that there was, that they had experience or that um, maybe that there's low experiences? Um, so that's a really good question. You know, that was one way that we asked that question by doing the everyday discrimination scale and having them rank um, the frequency in which those hap those events happen. But when we ask families in qualitative interviews or in the focus groups, there's really no shortage of um, talking about racism and discrimination. Their families were actually quite open with us more on a one-on-one -on -one setting um, or a focus group setting rather than a survey or an online survey. Um, but we also did really notice and feel a tension between families' experiences that were positive and families' experiences that were negative. Um, you know, families have long stays with us. They interact with so many providers. They feel um, this overwhelming gratitude. We, we certainly felt that for our care in the NICU, and they certainly don't want to diminish that. And they had experiences of racism and discrimination that, um, that those two things I think are hard to tease apart and grapple with the two realities at the same time. And I think, um, I think that's why we saw that in the survey. So like when you're taking a survey, do you really want to talk about all of the bad things? Or oh, I also want to talk about the good things too. Yeah, Sandrine. Hey, a fantastic talk and congratulations again on your award. Um, I actually had a very similar question, and I was going to uh, offer an alternative explanation and then uh, something that might actually impact the follow up to see if the intervention works. Because I'm wondering whether you um, are not actually capturing the people who are really uh, the target of all these adverse social uh, events, because they're like, I'm not going to speak up anymore because I'm already being seen as a troublemaker. And then the, the comment is going to make about the impact, if you do follow up surveys, you might actually see the almost paradoxical effects that the experiences of racism go up in the, the parent experiences, not because they actually go up, but because people feel more free to express it. Yeah, agreed, 100%. Yeah, that's something that we talked about, especially when we're, I'm currently revising that paper to think about the mechanisms of which, why people wouldn't disclose. and. Um, like you had said, you know, when we asked families about their experiences, they were also still in the hospital, which is like a, a incredible power dynamic um, of not wanting to report things while your child is still in our care. Um, and so I think that's one reason why when we conducted our focus groups after families have been discharged, there's a little bit more comfort there and disclosing information as well. So really important, I think, from thinking about how we're going to track this over time um, to consider. Um, on climate, uh, who has been watching on the on Zoom has a, a question. Can you talk more about the study of the design you are doing, examining how to increase the rate of breastfeeding and paying mothers to breastfeed? Yeah, okay. So I guess I don't need to repeat that because it's on Zoom. Um, so the, the intervention for um, providing remuneration for families who have the intention of breastfeeding, specifically Black and Latinx families. This is actually a quality improvement project. Um, so we have a number of interventions and that's one of the interventions of many. Um, and so the design of the study is really in the usual quality improvement design where you roll out an intervention, you see how it works. We certainly have um, surveys that we're administering to families about um, their comfort level with some an intervention like that, um, and then barriers and facilitators to breastfeeding in the NICU so that we better understand the problem so we can tailor our interventions to address them. Um, but in terms of, because you're asking more about the details of like how we're gonna remunerate families, et cetera, that's something that we're still discussing in our group, um, but we have like Visa gift cards that we're hoping to give early on in their stay um, with really clear messaging that this is like with the intent um, that you use it for, um, you know, uh, addressing any financial barriers that you have to breastfeeding and um, with a lot of great breastfeeding educational materials as well, like emphasizing the importance of it. But our family is really, we know these groups actually have the intention to breastfeed um, 
on the outset. So it's not really a problem about intention. Um, it's really these barriers that come up over time because um, our, our breastfeeding rates are actually pretty even um, at the beginning of a NICU stay. It's over time when families have to go back to work and have other childcare needs and um, the stress of the NICU, et cetera, that they, the rates drop off for Black and Latinx families. So um, yeah. All right. Well, that may do it. Thank you so much for a fantastic announcement.